Let's open our Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we're going to spend the in- majority of our time in verse 11. I'm going to introduce verse 11 from chapter 6, verse 33. But we've come to the heart of the Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer is just 70 Greek words. It's five verses in our Bible. And when you get to verse 11, you're in the middle verse. It truly, I mean, in every way, is the heart of this prayer. And it's the only part that we start expressing uh, our needs. We're kind of informed of what we need to do. We focus on God and surrender and follow him. But now we get to that, that most personal of all of our needs, our daily bread. And uh, I love, uh, of all the messages that are a part of the Lord's Prayer, I love this heart because what it's about is a choice that all of us have to make about whether or not we're going to go through life on a daily basis needing God. That's what the verse is about. It's uh, give us this day our what? Daily bread. By the way, when you said daily, did you know there's great controversy over that word being in this prayer? Do you remember Jerome, the guy that made the Vulgate, you know, the Latin Vulgate, uh, St. Jerome? He thought Jesus invented that word because it's nowhere else in any Greek literature ever found for all the centuries until they started excavating Egypt in the 19th century. And finally, they found out why that word was so rare. It was only used in women's shopping lists when they went to the market to get what they needed just that day. It's a very unique Greek word. And so we're looking at Christ's expectations for all of us. We're looking at Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33 introduces us when we talk about seeking God first, tells us how to do it. And if you back up from 6.33 to 6.9 through 13, we come to Jesus expressing to us a pattern. Remember, after this manner, it says in verse 9, pray ye. So Jesus didn't say pray these words. He said, This becomes the framework that you go through life knowing what your seven greatest needs are. Now, I love it. Jesus was big into sevens. Uh, All the way through the Gospel by John, it's heptatic. It's all sevens, you know. The seven titles of Christ in chapter one. The seven I am's are kind of like the framework of the book. The seven sign miracles. I mean, there's so many sevens, but then when you get to Revelation, it's just explosively into sevens. Well, here's another one. The seven greatest needs you and I have as we live through the end of days. And those seven greatest needs are, now I thought I'd do this. Again, I'm not not going to make you get up and down, get up and down. That's, That's for the young people in the Bible Institute. But you can still do everything they do other than the getting up and getting down. The way I keep my classes going is I regularly say, okay, I want all of you to stand right now it really transforms the class. They never know when I'm going to say that, and so they have to kind of be listening because it's very embarrassing if everybody else stands up and you didn't, and you, didn't even, you weren't even listening. You, know, you had your, your uh, AirPods in or something. So, uh, oh, I shouldn't tell this story, but I will. I won't look at Bonnie. Uh, I, I taught at the Master's Seminary in California. In fact, Bonnie and I were part of the inaugural faculty of the Master's Seminary in 1987 when it launched. And what that means is that I was teaching a full load of classes I'd never taught in my life. And Bonnie, I never learned how to type. She had to sit next to me and type everything because every test, every quiz, every handout, every overhead, everything had to be typed because it was a seminary. And I don't know how to type. I took Latin instead of typing. <laughs> right? I mean, typing was back then, I don't want to be, you know, sexist or anything, but typing was for girls in high school back in the 60s. They were going to be the secretaries. Us boys, we learned Latin. Well, we were doing the master's seminary, and I would have classes. I had every student in the master's seminary, a hundred of them, and they would be in these classes, and these were men coming from across the country with their families to prepare for the ministry. They worked a, a job 
any job they could get. Most of them worked all night long, these terrible graveyard shifts, and they would come in for an 8 o'clock class, and they'd sit there intently trying to listen, and they'd slowly fade away and fall asleep. And I had a deal. I did it every class. I said to the class, I said, I am going to do this. When I see someone that has fallen asleep, I'm going to look at you and go, and you're supposed to go bump, bump to the guy that's sound asleep and say, he asked you to close in prayer. <laughs> and so this poor father of five children that worked all night would be sound asleep and the person next to him would go, he asked you to close in prayer. He'd stand up and say, right in the middle of my lecture, <laughs> oh Lord, this has been such a wonderful class and everyone would just, <laughs> what you're doing, start laughing. Okay, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, what I am going to do is, you get to read the yellow on all the next four slides, and I'll read the red, okay? You ready? One, two, three, yellow. I, oh, I do the red. I, I, and we. But this is the one that, that has to make choices of obeying the Lord. I need God to focus me. To focus me on where I'm headed, that glassy sea, that throne, the, the fire that's emanating from before the throne that's flowing like a river that Daniel saw. Those, what we call theocentric cherubim, there are four of them, and they're always facing God, and they're flying around above and around the throne saying, holy, holy, holy. I need God to focus me on where I'm headed. This is not where I'm headed. Uh, I mean, this with, with thinking about the traffic and thinking about the, the everything is going up in price and thinking about the political climate right now and thinking about, I mean, what's going on in Europe and what's going on, I mean, it's like, wow, the world has never been in such a, a brink of something going to happen as we are right now. And I can get thinking about that all the time, and it's paralyzing. No, no, I need God to focus me on him. Okay, your second job. One, two, three. I need God. He's the only one that can control me. I can't control me. Uh, left to my own, my heart is deceitful and wicked. That's, that's what the scriptures say, and I am like the restless sea, and I'm prone to worry. By the way, do you know what worrying is? If you, have any of you ever worried? Could you confess that? Have you worried about anything? Okay. You ever been anxious? Okay. Do you know what that is? That's the opposite end of a very positive quality. That means you are really good at meditating. You're just meditating on all the wrong things. <laughs> when you worry, you're meditating on problems. You're meditating on, on, on all those things that you can't solve. Meditation is neutral. You get to choose whether you meditate on problems or on the promise of God. And God said, I want you to present your body back to me regularly. And so Paul, by the way, enlarges on Jesus' uh, after this manner pray, and Paul said, you should be praying without what? Ceasing. Yeah. So when I pray, a part of every prayer, including this morning, was, God, I need you today to control me. Apart from you, I can do all kinds of stuff. But it amounts, as John 15 says, apart from him, Everything I do amounts to nothing. That's what I need. I need to abide in him, and abiding in him is I need God to control me. Okay, number three. One, two, three. Oh, I need God to lead me. You see, I'm so prone to going my own way. I'm just like Isaiah said. All of us are like sheep, and every little lamb... And every not little older lamb wants to go their own way. And they have to choose to walk behind the shepherd. I need God to lead me. 
he said that, that he wants to show me the path of life, but he'll only show it to me if I'm following him. And that's why Jesus said, follow me. Okay, number four, and here's your last assignment. And that word daily is one of those, they like to call them by a funny word in, in uh, seminary, hapox legomenoi. How do you like that word? That means a one-time occurring word. As I said, Jerome thought that word was invented either by Jesus or by Luke uh, because it, or by Matthew because it's, it's only in those, those uh, accounts in only two of the Gospels about Jesus talking about this prayer. But give us this day our daily bread is me. Every day acknowledging I need God to supply me. What I tell the young people, it's hard to be in this uh, building without thinking about the, the hundreds of young people that God sends word of life every year and how they are truly the next generation. I mean, these young people are unbelievable. Uh, Bonnie and I were uh, going up to uh, New York. We, let's see, we always speak in New York the first two weeks of April. And so we were up there and, and we were coming in and uh, getting ready to park, you remember, and that guy stopped our car. You know, they have all this security because it's a real school. And, you know, and he was wearing all of his outfit and everything, and he stopped us and came up. And the look on his face when he leaned in our window. See, he, it was tinted and everything. It was a rental car from Albany Airport. And he looked in the window and he said, oh, you taught me, I don't know how many years ago, Revelation. He said, it changed my life. I said, what? He said, my wife and I were in the final stages. He said, I'm just working this summer. And he says, and we're going to a closed country. We both, since we left the Bible Institute, we, my wife and I have, have both trained in a medical field. We're going to a closed Muslim country. We're going to be working in a medical facility. And he said, we're doing all that because in the book of Revelation class, you said that there's some people God calls to go to difficult places and to expend their lives to share the gospel. And we found a way to evangelize Muslim people by moving to their country, having a job serving them in a medical facility, and then inviting them to our home to introduce them to Christ. Wow. You know, we think it's dangerous to go out on these wild roads, you know, when all the snowbirds come down and, and clog the way. You know, we think it's dangerous to, you know, go around the... the Publix, when all these vacationers are pushing their carts and hitting us, these people are going to a, a country where infidels are killed. And they're doing it willingly. I mean, Bonnie and I looked at his face. He was so radiant. And he connected the book of Revelation, the, the coming of the Lord, and our call to go into all the world. He connected it with his wife not to get the safest house away from danger in America, but to move into the hornet's nest to share the gospel. You know what, what he was doing? He was getting into a position where he needed God to supply him. And they saw it. They saw the Lord provide their support, their education, everything. Okay, I want you to think for a minute why this verse is so important, why this is the heart of the Lord's Prayer. All around us, we see that our batteries run down, right? Don't you plug in your phone all the time? Our tires wear out. Isn't it interesting that yesterday the EPA said the electric cars are, are twice as dangerous as gas-powered cars because electric cars weigh twice as much as normal cars, and it causes the tires to make nanoparticles of plastic that are being blown into the air that are twice as bad as all the fumes from the gas cars. Uh, aren't you glad the EPA figured that out yesterday? So our tires wear out, and if you've got one of those heavy electric cars, they're twice as fast as the gas cars. Our tires wear out, our paper's yellow and brittle. I was going through an old journal from my first missionary trip. I could hardly read it. 
It's all yellowed after 50 years. Our printed pictures fade, our bodies age and wrinkle, right? Can we testify to that? Nothing lasts as everything around us wears out. Everything, do you know why all this happens? Because everything but God is temporary. You see why we need him? He is the only self-sufficient, self-existent, needing nothing person in the universe. Wow. From the galaxies above to the cells within us, everything is wearing down. Everything is running out. Everything is fragile. And especially when we're faced with the eternal dimensions, or to us, the eternal dimensions of the universe, since only what is connected to God can last forever. Jesus said the best way to live is by inviting God to daily supply us. Do you understand? This is saying to God, I need you every day. And if you add the overlay Paul gave us and pray without ceasing, it means every time that I get to pray before a meal and before a trip and when I bump into someone in need and when I just am drawn to prayer, I need God and I need and I'm inviting him to supply us. So to get this simple truth planted in our hearts and minds, join me by reciting that middle petition. Now, here's the next thing I do to the kids. I say, I want all of you to do this. Now, you don't have to because I don't want any of you to get stuck, but if you're physically able, I want you to tip your head back and look up like you're looking up at God. And I want you to close your eyes. Don't, don't uh, you know, go to sleep on me. <laughs> and say those words. It's give us this day our daily bread. You ready? Tip back, eyes closed, like you're looking up at the throne. Let's say it to him. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. It's hard not to say all the rest. The only what's connected to God lasts forever, and by that request that you just said, every one of you that said it, just ask God to be connected to your day and to supply what Paul calls the grace to help because we are weak, and as the writer of Hebrews says, we, we are connected to the throne of grace and mercy, and we can find the grace to help in time of need. The heart of this prayer Jesus gave to his disciples, give us this day our daily bread. It's the most unsettling part. It was unsettling because Bible scholars thought that this was a mistake. I mean, I'm talking about Jerome. Jerome was in the fourth century. He thought this was a mistake. Jerome was a, a scholar. And he couldn't find that word anywhere in the Greek world, the Greco-Roman world. And it really has only been found in the, what we call the papyri, uh, the, the, the papers from the trash in Egypt that were buried in a landfill in the desert, never rotted because it's so arid out there. They took them away from the Nile River out into their trash heaps. In fact, there are books about this called From Egyptian Rubbish Heaps by Moulton and Geddon and all these great British scholars. And they found the, the, the landfills of the Roman world and they dug them up and inside were all of these pieces of paper that people would throw away, just like we do. Only they were frozen in time by the desert. And on multiple copies of little scraps of paper was that word, daily, and then, you know, little grain, little oil, little olive, and all of a sudden they realized it was, it was a word that was just used for people that just need a little bit of something to make it through that day. And that's what Jesus is saying. But it's very unsettling for us. Because this prayer is God inviting us to pray for needs that are personal and physical and, and it's hard for us as Americans because most of us like to, you know, stock up 
Uh, most people don't want to retire till they have enough money to live at the same level they lived their whole professional life. And so they never, they never stop working because they never quite have it. Uh, when Bonnie and I were ministering down in, in one church, I remember this young, zealous, soul-winning guy that was in industry in that, in that city came up to me and said, I want to go in the ministry. I said, oh, wonderful. You know, we have a group of men, and I'm teaching theology, and and we'll see how you can get plugged in the church, and then we'll send you off somewhere. But he said, well, no, I can't yet. He said, my wife says we're not quite ready. I said, oh, how will you know when you're ready? He said, she said, when we have $1 million cash in all of our savings accounts. I said, oh, okay. You know, you're, this is a partnership with your wife. A year later, he came, he said, I made it. He was in oil and gas, and it was a big bumper crop year, and he had a million after taxes cash. I said, great, go talk to your wife. He came back, you know, that was Sunday. He came back Wednesday night, and he said, she said, we have to have five. <laughs> Guess what? Two years later, it wasn't enough for her at five either. You see, we don't like needing daily anything. We want to have a lifetime saved up. Okay, what is this prayer teaching us? Number one, boom. God wants us to pray for our personal physical needs. You know, a lot of people think that's unspiritual. Did you know what this middle of the prayer is? God said it's okay to pray for personal, for physical needs. Every day, we're supposed to talk with God as our Father about our, person, our daily bread, what we need to make it through that day. Now, you know you have a friend if they feel comfortable talking about real life. And God says, I want to be like that. Secondly, this teaches us God wants us to pray for things that seem small and insignificant. A lot of people think, oh, I just can't pray because I don't... You listen to some of those prayers, and they're so elevated, you almost hardly can't even understand them, and they're so, oh, theological. God says, hey, it's okay to pray for small and insignificant things. Remember, he's the one that says, I, I, I have numbered the hairs on your head, and I know every time a sparrow falls. Uh, literally, what that verse where Jesus said that means, it says a sparrow hops. Jesus knows every time a bird hops. Have you ever watched birds? They don't, well, you know, penguins waddle, but normal birds hop between things. They're, they're just so energetic. They go boop, 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 boop. Jesus said, I'm aware of every hop of every bird everywhere, and I've numbered your hair, and it's okay if you want to pray for things that seem small and insignificant because I'm listening. Thirdly, God wants us to need him. Now, this is where it gets hard. God wants us to need him to get along each day. Do you know what the greatest days of parenting were when I look back at our eight children? The days when we would be somewhere and we'd be walking along and I would feel that hand going, and they were, they were trying to, the kids were trying to find my hand because they wanted to hold it, because they were a little unsure about, you know, they saw a dog over there or they saw, you know, heard something loud over there, and, and we would be walking along and you'd feel that, that hand bumping you because they want, it isn't me grabbing their hand and say, hold on to me, stop running around. It's them going, I need you. I'm afraid. I'm unsure. You see, God wants us. He's the one that wants us to need him. And this middle petition the, the very center, verse 11 of the Lord's Prayer, is our declaration, I need God. Now, how often do you tell him that? Well, it depends on how insulated you are. See, we insulate ourselves in every way. I mean, with the security systems of our homes and with our finances and with everything that we do so that we have we kind of keep needs or, or anything that would make us feel insecure at bay. And God said, hmm, my desire is that you constantly need me. Well, God wants us to pray for our personal and physical needs, pray for things that seem small and insignificant. He wants us to need him to get along each day. But look 
<laughs> Wait a minute. What is, what is that, that 11th verse? Give me this day my daily bread. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? Us. Look at this. See, this is the second thing that's really hard for Americans. Now, I don't have to preach this. I, uh, I've had the benefit of, I mean, speaking in many parts of the world, one of the most fascinating is it, in the old communist world, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, traveled there a lot, you know, 78 and 79 through 83, and then we got started with the ministry in Russia at one of our churches with Slavic Gospel Missions, and so I would preach in Russia a lot. Did you know over there, they were so poor under the communism uh, before the wall fell, if you were a Christian, your kids couldn't go to college, you couldn't be a professional. They had all these rules in communism for Christians. And so those people over there were resigned to the fact that as a Christian, they would never get ahead financially, their kids would never excel scholastically. And so what they did is they excelled at being Christians. I remember uh, I was speaking at a church in Poland and they said to me, uh, this is in the 70s, and they said to me, uh, church service starts at 8, but we have communion at 7. I thought, yeah, I've been to many churches where the staff meets and prays. I, it, I, I thought it was a little private group, and we're going to have communion to ask the Lord to really bless the day. I got there at 7. There were 500 people. In Poland in 1978, okay? I mean, we're talking about under total communism. And I just, I was amazed. I said, what is it? They said, we live in community with other believers. If there is any service, we all come. We don't, it's kind of like Thanksgiving dinner. The family members that, that boycott that really aren't close, right? They, the family comes. They said, church is the gathering of the family and we live in community. I'll never forget that either because they serve communion with what we would call a goldfish bowl. You know, one of those big glass that you have guppies in? That was the cup. And they took it, and 500 people went like this. We passed it from, it, it took an hour to do this. Took it, you handed the person next to you, they got it, and they went. And everyone in silence we're praying and worshiping the Lord as the fishbowl went around 500 people. God wants us to live in community with other believers. Okay, let me just tell you another lesson I learned. You know, a lot of times we don't see God at work because we don't need to see him at work. And so I remember when I was 22 years old, the Lord decided to teach me a lesson. I'd grown up in a Christian home, in a Christian family, in a wonderful church in Michigan, and had done all the stuff, you know, memorized the verses and everything. And I was given a little book called God Smuggler by my parents for one of my birthdays, and I read that book. You ever heard of him? Yeah, Brother Andrew. Have you ever read God Smuggler? How many of you have read God Smuggler? Did you ever notice on the very last page of the older editions, it said, if you ever want to contact Brother Andrew, just write him a letter at Brother Andrew, P.O. Box 147, Ermelo Holland. My personality, as soon as I got the book, you know, I usually look at the end to see how it ends because I don't want to be disappointed if my favorite person dies, so I always look at the end and read the ending. And I read that first, P.O. Box 147, Ermelo Holland, Brother Andrew, so I wrote him a letter that day. He wrote me back. I was 12 or 13 years old. We became pen pals. Back when they had those aerogram things on onion skin paper, do you remember? And, and we would go back and forth. And finally, when I was 22 years old, he said, do you want to go on a, one of our Bible smuggling trips? I said, I do, I do. And so I was all prepared to go. And I had no idea how much I was going to need the Lord. By the way, the first thing that happened is that my paperwork got all messed up and I was supposed to meet Brother Andrew in Bulgaria in 1978 and I couldn't get in uh, to Bulgaria and so I had to write him and say I couldn't come and I was so disappointed. My parents said, oh, don't worry, we have other friends that do that in Germany. We're just going to reroute your ticket and you can go to Germany. Uh, and that began this. I was dropped off a train in Germany 
went to my parents' friend's house in Germany, knocked on the door, and they said, you're late, the team has already left, and they put me on another train, and they said, you'll meet them, you know, in another, you know, part of southern Germany. So I got on a train and, and got off, and seven other team members were already in the bus. And there were seven seats in the bus. And they didn't want me to come. They were all Germans, and I was the American, and they would not speak in English to me. And the leader said, I had to sit on the floor. This is a Christian Bible smuggling mission where we're all believers going to serve Northern Africa Muslims with the Bibles, and they made me sit on the floor of the bus. It was hot, it vibrated, it was diesel. Uh, you know, the smoke would settle down. Diesel, you know diesel? It made me nauseous. It, the floor was hot because it was closer to the diesel engine that was, uh, it was funny, it was a rear pusher uh, bus. Made me sick. God was teaching me I had to come to a point where I totally needed him. We drove 3,000 kilometers with me sitting on the floor. When we got to Malaga, southern, just before you get to Gibraltar, the very bottom of Spain, the end of Spain, the start of Gibraltar, Malaga is down there. Everybody in the bus was sick but me. <laughs> I think the diesel smoke. They all got the flu, and one by one, they, they would stop, and they'd run into the bushes and vomit and everything else, and finally the leader for the first time spoke in English to me. He said, we're so sick. I said, you speak English. He said, will you drive? He said, we have to get to Malaga, and I can't. We were in the Costa del Sol campground, and I said, sure. He gave me the map. To make a long story short, that transformed the trip. You know, by the way, I, I started memorizing. I was sitting there on the floor memorizing verses. It takes away nausea. If any of you are afflicted with nausea, <laughs> uh, memorize verses. And uh, it really worked. And, and so I was just growing and rejoicing in all of them. They were really, I think it was part of judgment of the Lord for their meanness, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> but we got to Malaga, and they told us what we were supposed to do. We picked up 6,000 Arabic Bibles that were hand-addressed from Transfer Radio to go to every known person interested in Christianity in the 22 nations of Dar al-Islam, all 22 of the Arab-speaking Muslim nations that had written to Transworld Radio in the 70s. Transworld Radio had collected their addresses, found a calligraphist. They wrote their name and address on a brown paper-wrapped Bible with a Christian gospel track in it. And those, all 6,000 of them were in a trailer, and they hooked us up to that trailer, and they said, you have to smuggle them into the Muslim world. And you know what they said, the team? They said, since you're already driving, why don't you just drive? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I drove along, got in line. To, we crossed at Gibraltar into Morocco on a ferry, got off the ferry. I drove. There were about 12 cars in front of me. I thought, this is really going to be exciting. Oh, it was. <laughs> we were there for like seven hours. There were only a handful of cars in front of us. Everyone got out of the car. The guards took everything out of the trunk of the car. The guards took the carpets out and the mats out of the car. The, the guards began sticking things into the gas tank, these long, like, uh, you know, fishing around, see if anything's floating in there. They, they got on trolleys and, and, and with wheels and went underneath the car and were banging and feeling under the car to see if they were smuggling anything under it. They unbolted the seats, took them out of the cars and were tapping to see if it had a false floor. That was the first car. And then they put it all back together and they drove away and they did the exact same thing to the second car for a half hour or 45 minutes. I was driving a van with 6,000 Bibles. They weren't even hidden in the floor. It, they were in the trailer. They were in the brown paper sacks they used to give away at supermarkets, you know, those brown ones? They were just stacked in there, 6,000 with addressed 
names and addresses of every known interested in Christianity person in 22 Muslim countries. You know what I thought? The closer we got, I thought, this is a death mission for those people. Can you imagine a policeman knocking on your door and saying, why would an American group uh, or a German group or whatever have your name and address with a Christian track, a Bible, and a gospel message here in Saudi Arabia? How did they get your address? Can you imagine that 6,000 police visiting 6,000 families? Okay, to make a long story short, it was finally our turn, and we had gotten there at 7 a.m. It was about five minutes to 12. I pulled up, I had the eight passports in my hand, I knew the drill, I already had, you know, I prepare, I already had unlocked the door, and I was starting to open the door, and my door wouldn't open. And what I, you know, I, I looked out, and the Moroccan guard in his dark blue suit with that, those white hats, they're just really sharp looking, like kind of like Marines at funerals, you know, really dressed up with his rifle and everything. He had turned, and he had his knee against my door. And he was standing there with his knee against my door looking at something, and so I looked at what he was looking at, and he was looking at the clock. And the clock was going, and the whistle went, the noon whistle. And he went like this and turned and went like this, and he was off duty. No more opening cars for him. <laughs> and the other group came out, fresh, new, like this. And you know, they looked at our eight-person bus and that trailer behind it, and the guy took my passports and he looked at him and he says, American, because mine was an American passport on the top, the rest were German. And he just handed them to me and went. And we were the only car in both directions that didn't get taken apart. So that was a great lesson, but that wasn't the lesson, yeah. That was just in. We still had to deliver the 6,000. Now we were gonna get it. If the police caught us with 6,000 Bibles in a Muslim country, it, it, smuggling them in, because it said on the border you could not bring in pornography, alcohol, or Christian literature. Morocco doesn't allow pornography, alcohol, or Christian literature. So we got driving along, and the problem was, and by the way, I only have eight minutes, and the reason I'm telling you this is because the context of Matthew 6, of what God wants, but the bottom line is this, we got in there and we had to deliver all of our load in two places. 3,000 of them mailed in mailboxes all over the country of Morocco. And we went to every post office in Morocco for two weeks, bought stamps, licked, and, and put four or five in every post office box. And I covered the country. I mean, I, you wanna know about Morocco, we've been to every mailbox in Morocco and every post office you can find in Morocco, bought the same stamps and mailed 3,000 packages. But the other 3,000, our only instructions were take them to Fez, F-E-S. The, the most well-known believer in Morocco lives in Fez. I asked the team leader, I said, uh-huh, what's the address? You, you're asking me to drive, give me the map, what's the address? He says, oh, no one has his address. The man says, if God wants me, this Fez Christian, to deliver the Bibles for him, you will find me. I said, that is a joke. They said, no, it's not. Every group finds him. I said, how? They said, just pray. Okay. I'm the driver. I said, okay, I'm driving. You guys pray. In the back, the first team member said, I really believe we go on this road in Fez. All of a sudden, I started driving down that road. Another person in the back says, and we turn here. I said, really? The third person, we turn here. I'm still driving. We have this trailer and this this Fez, have you ever been to Fez? It's kind of like the old city in Jerusalem. The, the roads are narrow, there are donkeys, there are people, all this stuff, and carts and everything, and we're going into the city toward the center. And, and the fourth person said, we turn here, the fifth person, each of them are praying, and they just said, they believe we should do this, and I was obedient, and finally the last person said that, and we turned the corner and came into the town square and in front of us was the biggest mosque you ever saw, the central mosque of Fez. And I said, well, I believe that we should just park 
and I'm going to pray here. Because I said, I have no idea what to do. And I said, I don't even know how I'm going to turn this thing around. Because I could see there was no more road ahead of us. It ended in the square. So here's this gigantic Western European vehicle with a gigantic trailer behind it that just pulled up into the center of an old city with a gigantic mosque. And just as I pulled to the curb and turned the car off to pray. You know, the call to prayer thing. Have you ever heard how loud that when, the, when they start it from the, the top of this minaret? At that instant, every person in that city started flocking toward the mosque. It was like a black river of black outfits. Do you know what I mean? They're all wearing their, their outfits. And they were crawling between the trailer and the bus, in front of the trailer and the bus, around the trailer and the bus, and going, and I said, we really need to pray. Because I said, again, I said, I don't even know how I'm going to turn the bus around. And I bowed my head to pray out loud and said, Lord, we don't know where to go. And we have 3,000 Bibles. Would you help us? And as I prayed, on my window, the biggest smiling face was looking through the window at me. And I unrolled the window and he said, wow. He said, I live on the third floor right there of that building you're parked in front of. He said, I was on my knees at my chair where I've been. He said, the entire two weeks I've known that you were in my country. And I've been saying, Lord, the only time they can deliver those Bibles and I not get caught is during the call to prayer. Because everybody that cares about Islam is in there on their face, on the rugs, praying. And he said, I was on my knees praying. I looked out the window. And just as the call to prayer came, he said, this huge, unmistakable Western vehicle pulled up in front of my house. And he came. We unloaded the 3,000 Bibles. He distributed them to all the churches of Morocco. And we learned what a life in step with God is. It's someone that needs God every day. So let me go like this. This is where I get in trouble, and I'm sorry. What's the context of a life like this? Look at verse 14, and let me just read these to you. I'm not going to expand on them. Jesus said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Jesus said, the only way that you can be connected to me in this prayer is to be forgiving of others. We'll cover that tomorrow. Secondly, he said, we must be those who deny ourselves. Verse 16, moreover, when you fast, he didn't say if you fast, Jesus assumed that believers fasted, okay? Fasting is denying self, prayer is seeking God. Number 19, he says, those of you that are going to be cooperating with me in this prayer and a life in step with me, you are also going to be investing in heaven. You're not laying up for yourselves treasures on earth. You are also, verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, you're going to be seeking purity. By the way, we're all as pure as we want to be because we choose what we let to come through our eyes. And Jesus said, if your eye is good, it's interesting, the old King James says, single. If, if you have a singularity, if you, if you have an eye that, that has chosen to simply focus on what pleases Christ, he said, your whole body will be pure. Then he said, no one can serve two masters. Those whose life is in step with me are clinging to me, not to the world. And then you don't meditate about what you don't have. Remember what Paul said, I have learned, therefore, in whatever state I am, therefore, to be what? Content. Content. We learn contentment. And that takes us right back to where we started, verse 33. Stay focused on why we're here. If we're seeking first the kingdom of God, I need God. It's his kingdom. I need to focus on him. I need him to control me. I need him to lead me. And the only way I can make it, as I learned on that trip, the only way we could deliver those Bibles was not in our human ingenuity, but needing God. Do you need God? I like to call needing God this, hungering for God. See, the, the, give us this day our daily bread. Bread is what we, the sustenance we need, but we hunger not for the bread, but for the one that gives it. See, that's the essence, the heart of this prayer. Learning to hunger not for the need, but for the giver. 
for the one who is the source, the one who can supply, the one who can provide. And so do we hunger for God? Oh, it's 10 o'clock. So I'll just say this. Would you like to revitalize your spiritual life? The Lord's Prayer gives us a key to how to do that. Would you like to heighten your awareness of God? Would you like to experience God in such a deep and intimate way you find yourself absolutely satisfied and contented, which the Bible defines as this perfect peace? Well, Jesus explains that. He, he says it in that verse, when you fast, remember in um, verse 16, but he really enlarges on it in in Mark 2, Jesus talks about fasting in a way that I think most of us haven't noticed. Jesus said, after me, the bridegroom, after I leave, my disciples, he said, they don't fast now because the bridegroom's with them. Chapter 2, 18 to 22. But he said, when I'm gone, they're going to be fasting. Do you know what the most neglected spiritual discipline of the 21st century is? fasting. Oh yeah, we fast for our blood sugar levels in our blood tests, yeah. And we fast before we do this and that, or we fast if there's a wedding and we got to fit in the, the outfit. But, but the spiritual discipline of fasting? Fasting is the expression of hungering for God. Biblical fasting, Jesus said, was part of our normal life. Moreover, when you fast. He just expected they were going to be fasting. Do you remember Anna, Simeon and Anna? Biblical fasting is part of worshiping the Lord. Anna was 80-some years old. I'm not going to have us raise hands. How many of us are 80-some years old? We think fasting is for the younger people. Anna, who was elevated as, as an incredible example of godliness, served God with fastings and prayer night and day. Night and day? She didn't eat and she didn't sleep. Kind of sounds like being old. And she didn't complain and... and think it was limiting her and everything else. She served God and worshiped him with fastings and prayer. Biblical fasting is part of preparation Christ had in facing temptation. He ate nothing before he had to meet with the devil and be tempted. Acts 13, the New Testament church, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, wow, biblical fasting was part of seeking guidance from the Lord in the early church. As they were fasting and praying, that's when Paul and Barnabas got launched. And finally, biblical fasting was part of sending them out in the next verse. After they picked them, before they sent them out, they fasted and prayed and then laid hands on them and then sent them away. Well, biblical fasting was part of appointing spiritual elders and churches. They appointed the elders, Paul, on his missionary journey did. And finally... It was part of the regular life of spiritual ministry. When Paul talks about his own life, kind of his spiritual autobiography in 2 Corinthians 11, he said, I was in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often and hunger and thirst and in fastings often. You know, we all say, well, how did Paul do all that? I mean, he was fearless, he was bold, he was the energizer bunny. How did he go on after being stoned and imprisoned? Well, he had a regular part of his spiritual life and ministry that is notably absent. When's the last time you heard a spiritual fasting message? Not very often. So, the Lord's Prayer is, focus me on who you are as God. It's transformational. Control me because you have a plan, something only I can do. Lead me so it happens in my life, but supply me so I can see your hand and see that it's you, not me. Tomorrow when we get together, cleanse me so I can keep on having that blessing in my life. Do you see the context that comes in verse 14? If we're not forgiving, God won't forgive us? Boy, isn't that a question. What does that verse mean? Verse 14, I'm glad we're doing that tomorrow, and then empty me. These are seven simple truths that God said, I want them renewed every day in your life. Today's truth, hunger for God. That's what he wants from our lives. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, I thank you that you want to bring us into situations each day where we need you, where we can't do it ourselves, where we, we can only... Know that that happened 
because of you. I think of those hymns we sing. I need you, oh, I need you every hour. I need you. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. That's really what you ask us in the Lord's Prayer to do. That's the heart of the Lord's Prayer. Needing you, God, so we see your hand every day doing what we could never do in our lives. We surrender to that. We, we invite you. We focus on you. And like you said, we want to seek you first. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.